definitely have been at least 10 years ago. Now, I, I, everybody's nodding their head now. You can hear me now. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so we first wanted to say thank you for your support through the years. It's been a tremendous um, blessing uh, to know that we don't have to worry whether Cornerstone Baptist Church is going to send a support check. It's there every month faithfully, and um, we appreciate that. That is what keeps us on the field. Your financial support and your prayer support mean the world to us, and, and we literally could not be there without those things. So thank you for that. Um, now, if you have your Bible, I'd invite your attention to Matthew chapter 9. I, uh, I read uh, this story recently, and I'm going to start, I'm going to introduce this text by reading this story. And when I came across this, it really touched my heart. And I determined, well, you know, the story is most missionaries only have one message anyway. But quite honestly, I determined to preach this message everywhere I went because of the impact that this made on my heart and the heart that I have for wanting to see God work in the lives of other people and uh, primarily in the way of calling them to the mission field. So if you'd bear with me as I read this and then as we get into scripture, I think you'll see where it's leading. Uh, I said Matthew chapter 9. I hope you're there already. We'll read that in just a second. So here's the story. The story's about an apple farmer. Once upon a time, there was an apple farmer and he had thousands of acres of apple trees. One day he went to town to find apple pickers. He found hundreds and brought them to the farm, expecting them to be able to handle the task of picking all the apples. Now some volunteered to package the apples that were picked, some volunteered to drive the trucks, some volunteered to be cooks to feed the apple pickers. Then there were the accountants to count the apples, and of course there were administrators. And when all was said and done, out of the many hundreds who were hired to actually pick apples, only 100 people actually became full-time apple pickers. So these 100 pickers started harvesting immediately. 95 of them began picking around the homestead. Before long, the storehouse that had been built at the homestead was mostly filled by the 95 pickers with beautiful, delicious apples. Now the orchard surrounding the homestead had many apple trees, but only 5% of the apple trees were there around the homestead. And almost all the workers concentrating on them, soon those trees were almost bare. In fact, the 95 apple pickers working on the homestead acres began having difficulty finding trees that had not been picked. As the apple picking slowed down around the homestead, the workers began channeling efforts into building larger storehouses and developing better equipment for picking and packing. Sadly, those 95 pickers working on the homestead began fighting among themselves. As incredible as it might sound, some began stealing apples that had already been picked. Although there were enough trees on the other thousands of acres to keep all the workers busy, they just kept working near the homestead. Now the other five pickers, they looked out into the distance and saw the far away acres of trees beyond the homestead and how many thousands of acres there were of the trees left full of apples, but with only five pickers, there were far too few to gather all the fruit. So by the hundreds, and thousands, apples rotted on the trees and fell to the ground. The lonely five pickers knew that an apple is an apple wherever it may be picked. They knew that apples around the homestead were just as important as apples far away. Still, they could not erase from their minds the thought, the sight of thousands of trees which had never been touched by a picker. They longed for more pickers to help them pick the apples on the faraway trees. And one has to wonder how happy the owner is going to be when he comes back and he looks out and sees all the acres and acres of untouched trees with the untouched apples. Now I ask you to turn here to Matthew chapter 9. I want to read here in Matthew chapter 9 beginning in verse 35. Would you, 
Would you read along with me there in chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, God, I am very grateful to be here at this place and have the opportunity to express our gratitude for what this church has done for us, God. Thank you for them. I ask now, God, that you would work in our hearts in such a way that, that the, the thought of a plenteous harvest falling to the ground might grip our hearts yet again. I ask God that you would move in the hearts here tonight. Lord, whatever you'd like to see done in each one of us, May we respond to that, whatever your Holy Spirit would ask us to do. I'm grateful for your love and care and how you work in our lives, God. I pray that you continue to do that. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if we were to read here in chapter 9, uh, starting back in verse 1, what would we see? We would see that Jesus, here he's just returned to his own city. And uh, immediately he heals, verse 2 says he heals a paralyzed man. Then verse 9 says he called Matthew into his service. Uh, verse 18, he heals a ruler's daughter. Verse 20, he heals a woman diseased for 12 years. Verse 27, he heals two blind men. Verse 32, he heals a person possessed with a devil. Sounds like a pretty full day, doesn't it? But this is just what Jesus did, right? This was a day in the life of Jesus. And this is what he did. And as we read there in verse 35, it tells us that he went into all the cities and all the villages. And what did he do? He taught and he preached and he healed every sickness of every person that came across him. And as he was doing this, though, many, many more, you could imagine that as Jesus was healing, the stories about him would be spread across the countryside. And those with sick people would bring them to him. Can you imagine how many people were being brought to Jesus every day? Every day, new people were coming to him, multitudes on multitudes. And as this began to happen, as it always did happen, it evoked a typical emotion in Jesus. Verse 36 says, when he saw those multitudes, those many, many who kept coming to him, he was moved. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion on them. Compassion was the emotion that Jesus felt. And this, this word, uh, uh, compassion, used 12 times in the New Testament. Nine of those times are describing a reaction that Jesus had toward the people around him. This was a word that was associated with Jesus. See, his eye affected his heart. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says this, If you would sum up the whole character of Christ... In reference to us, it might be gathered into one sentence. He was moved with compassion. That's what he felt toward us. The eye sees and the heart feels. Compassion, it's, it's pity. It's sympathy. And what made him have this reaction? It tells us in verse 33 here. It was looking out at all these people. These weary people, these people who were fainting. And how did he view them? He viewed them as lost sheep. Uh, anybody here worked with sheep before? Sheep are not, I'll just be honest with you, they're not very smart animals. They're very simple minded animals and they're followers. And uh, they, they need someone to lead them, they need someone to guide them. Otherwise, they scatter and they get lost, and then they get lonely, and then they don't know what to do. Not very smart. And, and this, is how, this is how Jesus saw these multitudes that were coming to them, weak, tired, weary people who didn't have anyone to lead them, to guide them. And his heart was touched 
by this sight of these multitudes coming to him. And he felt compassion, he felt sympathy, he felt pity. The, the lostness and lack of direction that he saw in them is what made him feel this emotion of compassion and pity. Again, the eye sees, the, the heart feels, and compassion, see, compassion always leads to action. And what did it lead Jesus to do? See, see compassion, or we can say love, love refuses to ignore a need. Love cannot ignore a need. So Jesus' action here was to speak, turn around and speak directly to his disciples. And what does he say to his disciples? Verse 37 tells us very clear. Then saith he unto his disciples, this is what he said, the harvest is plenteous. Truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. See, first thing here, the harvest, the field, it's wide open. Uh, in, in, in one way we can say there's a whole lot of apples out there. There's a wide open field. I don't know what kind of crops you have in here. As we were driving up uh, this, this afternoon, saw a lot of corn in Indiana. Looked like some soybeans out there too. Uh, we have wheat in Oklahoma. So uh, you, you may be familiar with harvest time here. As a matter of fact, this is, this is, we call this harvest time, this time of year. Right now we call it harvest. And uh, there's, a, there's a universal principle concerning, concerning the harvest. Uh, if, if the harvest doesn't get harvested, it does not last forever. There's a window of time to work in the harvest. Jesus here, he's already been traveling around and he's done what he could do. He's gone everywhere and it was very clear he went to all the village and he healed every disease. He's done all that he could do and yet there's so much more that needs to be done. So much more that needs to be done. People are weak and weary and like lost sheep and they're everywhere. It's plenteous. When you think about a harvest that's plenteous, I mean, that's usually good news. You've got a great harvest. You've got a great harvest. Uh, but there's a, there's a bad thing that goes with this great harvest. Such a good, ripe harvest ruins if it's not reaped. I, I read this, this quote from a guy named Von Schlicker. The God of grace often gives us, his children, second chances. But there's no second chance to harvest a ripe crop. We get one chance at that. Doesn't that make sense? Right? If we don't finish the harvest before it falls to the ground, it ruins. That's the way it works in fields. If you don't collect the harvest, it goes to ruin. We get lots of chances. We get many chances. The God of grace gives us many chances as his children. But the harvest does not get a second chance. That's really, that's bad news. Second thing Jesus says here is about the harvest is that the laborers, the laborers are few. Now anybody in, uh, in full-time ministry can, can tell you it's not glamorous work. It's hard. It can be slow. It can be heartbreaking, can it, Pastor? It can be very heartbreaking. As the as the story that I read there at the beginning, most of the work, we say most of the workers is happening around the homestead. In preparation for this uh, message, I did a little research. See, I'm, my background is in engineering, so I'm a bit of a numbers person. And I did some research into this uh, idea about um, the number of missionaries. Now, that'd be hard to quantify the number of missionaries, because we as, as independent Baptists, we don't like to keep records and things like that. So what I did is I took the number of, of Baptist churches in America, and considering that there would be one pastor at each church, probably wouldn't be true in every case, um, but there's several, several, several thousand churches in America. 
And if we were to just say one full-time worker for each church, um, an estimate here would be in the, in the number of 120,000 Baptist churches. And I say Baptist, I'm including Southern Baptist, Baptist churches, just for numbers sake. Uh, I also did some cursory research into the number of missionaries, and I included Southern Baptist missionaries. So the numbers that I found out uh, with the Southern Baptist Convention, and they have 3,714 missionaries, uh, which is the biggest number of Baptist missionaries of any group. There'd be uh, at least 30 other missions organizations, and I had no clue that there'd be that many organizations that send out missionaries or are responsible or track missionaries. 30 other organizations. I would have guessed maybe 15 or 20, but, but 30 others. And so the number that I found that are associated with these 31, counting the Southern Baptist Convention, would be about 5,570 missionaries. Now, not every missionary is sent through an organization. Some are sent through local churches. So I added 20% to that, which I think is a generous number. And you would get to a number of 6,600 and something. And uh, it's curious there that those work out to about 95% and 5%. The number of full-time workers here in America, which would be a conservative estimate, 95% uh, would be right here in America. And 5% of the full-time workers would be dedicated to the rest of the world. 5%. Now that's curious because you can Google something else very interesting and, and, and there's many sources that point to this. If you were to reduce the uh, population of the world down to a village of 100 people, so right, we're just condensing down the percentage of the population of the world. Uh, this, is, this is interesting what I found with that. 7.8 billion people in the world roughly. But if you reduce that down to 100 people, 61 of those people would be Asian. It's a lot. If this, if this earth truly were flat, it would be leaning to one side. 61 of those people would be Asian. 13 would be African. 12 would be European. 9 would be from Central and South America. And 5 would would be from North America. Now, does that stick out to anybody? 5% of the population is found here in North America. So we have an estimate of 95% of the workers reaching 5% of the population. Does that make sense? I, I look at this and I have to say, is this God's design? Is this God's plan that 95% of the work dedicated for reaching people is happening for 5% of the population? When I looked at that, Pastor, I was a little flabbergasted. 95% reaching 5%. And I had to ask the question, God, is this your plan? Is this your design? And the alternative, if it's not God's plan, then it has to be our failure. It has to be our failure. It has to be man's failure. I look at this, and, and when Jesus says here, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few, seems to fit with exactly what we're seeing with numbers. Now, we look at this, we say, oh, what can be done? What can we do? What can we do about this? Well, what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? Written right here in verse 38. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Before anything else, what we should do is pray. Pray that he would send forth, that, that God would send forth laborers. Now, there's something very interesting about this word send forth here. The, uh, uh, 
the Greek word behind this is ekbalo. Uh, and what that, what that means is you got you have two words joined here, ek and balo. Ek means out, and balo, it, it may be familiar to some like uh, ballista or ballistics, like a catapult, right? Blasting, blasting out is the idea here. And this word used in other places, when Jesus uses the word to cast out demons or to thrust something out. So what Jesus is saying here. Pray the Lord of the harvest that we would thrust people out into this harvest field that is so plenteous and where the laborers are so few that we should pray that God would blast people out of these churches into needy fields that are bursting, ready to be harvested. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would launch like a, like a catapult, launch these people out into the harvest peel field. Now, so many times when people are praying, I can have a I can tell you a personal testimony for myself. Um, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. My wife both. We we became involved in in Bible Baptist Church in Stillwater, Oklahoma, first independent Baptist church where we actually got to see and touch a missionary never seen or touched one before. And when confronted with this idea of missions and how it's before the people in our independent Baptist churches, so often we begin to pray about missions and, and for missionaries and, and giving the faith promise and these kinds of things. And I found when, when we begin to pray, sometimes God reaches down and says, you, I want you. Now, I said my, my career was in uh, engineering. I graduated from Oklahoma State University and got a job there in Stillwater as an electrical engineer. We had children, had my career. I was about 30 years old and uh, fairly happy doing what we were doing. And yet God comes and says, I want you. Now, I wasn't real excited about that. I'm just to be honest with you. I wasn't real excited about that. I, I couldn't dream that God would want to use someone like me. Someone so simple. Someone so backward. Someone so shy like myself. I, I, I tell this story a lot. When I went to Oklahoma State University, I, I looked at the uh, degree requirements. I had an interest, but I was also very scared of public speaking. So I looked at the degree requirements and if it required speech, Pastor, I said, no, I can't do that one. Let me look at another one. See, because I never imagined myself standing in front of people saying anything. And yet, here comes God and he says, but I want you. I want you. And I struggled with that because I knew me. But I had to come to a point where I understood that God knows me too. And it's not me, it's him. And I'm not going to represent me, I'm going to represent him. And after some hard times, struggling with this, finally came to the point where I said, okay God, I don't know what you're going to do and I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'll say yes. See, sometimes when we start to pray uh, for workers to go into the harvest, sometimes we end up, it's us. God's interested in. Now, I don't know. Here tonight, there might be somebody, God may be already dealing with some of you. Um, can I give you a word of encouragement? Don't fight it. Don't resist it. Don't run. Just obey. Just be in obedience. Now, the least, when, when Jesus saw this multitude of the harvest, he turned to his followers and said, Pray, pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's exactly what we as his children should be doing, praying that God would send people into his harvest field. Praying that right here from Cornerstone Baptist Church that God would, would, would blast out people from this congregation into the mission field. That's how we start. We start by praying um, 
then beyond that, we, we have to ask ourselves here, at, when, when Jesus was confronted with this situation, see, his eye affected his heart. What he saw moved him with compassion. I have to ask, do, do I have the compassion that Jesus has for the lost? Do I have his heart when I look out uh, around Indianapolis, around where you live, around your neighborhood? I'm sure you can look around maybe on your street that you live on and see a truly great harvest. And it's ripe and it's ready to be harvested, ready to be collected. So are you praying? Are you praying that God would send laborers into this harvest? And, and I want to I want to say sometimes. The, the laborers that he wants to send ends up being us. And so that leads me to the last thing I'm going to say here is, is am I going to the harvest myself? And then I want to add this little thing on the end here. Am I, am I willing to go to the harvest wherever it may be? You see, like, like Pastor Salazar, I'd never heard of Slovenia when I was first confronted with it either and I had to go look up where it was um, but Slovenia is not the only place where there's a need uh, for workers I can think of many places in Europe where I don't know of any missionary and you say well there could be some there and you just don't know about it well it's it's a it's a pretty tight knit community and we 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 all kind of know about each other there so if somebody were there i probably would know about it and i can tell you i can i can just begin naming countries of of millions of people where there's no one where there's not one not one independent baptist missionary um so i just want us tonight to look at this passage of scripture and try to capture the heart here, the heart that Jesus had for those who he looked out and saw. And, and if you could get this vision of, of looking out across the world, knowing that, that the 5% uh, of workers is trying to reach the 95% of the population. Does it, does it sound like there needs to be some help there because there does. There very seriously does need to be some help. And as I said, I committed to preach this message in every church that I was in just because of how heavy this is on my heart. We've been on the field 10 years, and it was a struggle for us to get into the country. And uh, um, thankfully, in the time that we've been there, we started an organization that is is helping other people come into Slovenia, and we've seen three other families come now. So you say there's four missionaries in Slovenia? Oh, what well, must be covered? Not at all. Not at all. And that's just our, our tiny Slovenia, four missionaries to cover the entire country. Uh, I think of Austria, who borders Slovenia, and I can think of uh, two missionaries, and I think there's about eight million people there. Think of Croatia, with another probably four or five million there. I can think of three missionaries there. Macedonia, I can't think of anybody. Serbia, there's one. Millions of people. Montenegro, none. Bosnia, none. I could go down a list of places that need someone to go and tell them of the great love that God has for them and the great sacrifice that he made by sending his son, the great gift that has been offered to all of them. Just looking for someone to be willing to go. Someone from the 95% to go and reach the 95%. Ask ourselves, if it's not God's design, and I can't believe that it is God's design, that 95% of the workers are to reach 5% of the population, then pray, 
pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Would you stand to your feet with me here tonight? I want to end um, in like this. I'd like for you to, to uh, ask yourself, God, what part would you have me be in this? God, what do you want me to do? What should my reaction be in response to this? And then whatever that may be that God would lead any one of us to do, would you just be faithful? You just be obedient to follow whatever God is prompting you to do. And at the very least, we'd commit to pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your goodness, mercy, love, and care for us. I sit here and I almost feel guilty that to, to be the privileged who, who got to hear the message of salvation and I got to hear it right and I didn't have to overcome some false teaching. God, thank you for that. And I know not everyone in the world has that privilege. And God, they deserve it as much as I did. So God, I do want to pray that you would, that you'd send forth laborers into your harvest because it's plenteous. And I already know the laborers are few. God, would you get the honor and glory from our response to this word here this evening? And at the very least, we'd commit to pray on purpose, pray that you would send laborers into your harvest. Make it, make it a, a serious commitment that every day we would pray that God would send laborers into his harvest. Lord, again, I ask you to be honored and glorified in our response to your word this evening. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.